Did we see domination in the trenches for the Falcons just like we wanted? We're breaking down day one of Falcons-Dolphins joint practices on today's Locked on Falcons. You are Locked on Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. So, guys, welcome back to this illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast or daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And, of course, I'm your very humble host, Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. Sirius Black. And I want to thank each and every one of you that makes this illustrious podcast your first listen each and every day follow in the footsteps of the everydayers by subscribing or following for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. So for your first listen today, we'll be talking all about Falcons, Dolphins, day one of joint practices. We'll be getting a little bit later into the injury to Clark Phillips and got some good news on that front uh, so far. And we'll answer a couple of listener questions about sort of where the Falcons are weakest and strongest in terms of their depth a little bit later on the show. But jumping right into it, talking about day one of joint practices, of course, I was not there on hand in Miami Gardens. By all accounts, it was a sweltering day, like the Georgia heat, you know, that South Florida heat apparently put the Georgia heat to shame today. But, you know, in all that heat, it was apparently a back and forth practice by all accounts. You know, some positives on both sides for teams. You know, it seemed like the majority of Dolphins reporters that were on hand were leaning a little bit towards the Dolphins winning the day. But it wasn't sort of as handily as we've seen in the past. Like if you go back two years with the Falcons Dolphins joint practices back in 2021, you know, it was the, apparently by all accounts, the, Dol- the Falcons, you know, owned the Dolphins on that first day of practice. And then you go back last year with the Falcons Jets joint practices and much to the chagrin of many Falcon feds, you know, by all many accounts, it was the Jets that allegedly, you know, owned the Falcons on that first day of practice. And it didn't seem like that was the case here. If the Dolphins won the day, then it was barely that they won the day. But it sounds like the Falcons won the day in the area that we wanted to see them win the day, which is in the trenches. That that was probably the area where you felt best about the Falcons' ability to sort of match up not only on offense and the defensive side of the line of scrimmage. Uh, of course, you know, it was a hectic day, as these often are, you know, multiple units working on multiple fields of practice down in Miami. Uh, so, you know, you had eyes at different places. And so you probably saw some conflicting tweets and whatnot and reports out there about who threw the pass and, you know, shout out to Steve Smith, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, certain guys winning reps and all that stuff, but that's just due to so much stuff happening and people have different eyes in different places. You know, one factor that could have contributed to the Falcons winning the day, at least for, in terms of their defensive line going up against the Dolphins offensive line was the fact that Teron Armstead did not practice for the Dolphins on this day. We talked about that on yesterday's episode, how Teron Armstead is the one proven good uh, offensive lineman on the Dolphins starting five. So that may have contributed to it. Now, Calais Campbell, John o. Smith, who had not practiced uh, in a, several days with for the Falcons, were on hand to do some sideline work with the Falcons. Uh, from what I understand, they did not get into the team phase. And we talked a little bit about Calais Campbell's return to the practice yesterday and how the Falcons are probably going to ramp him up. So you'll probably see him get sideline work, but none of the team stuff uh, throughout the week. But we heard multiple reports of sacks of both Tuantaga Vailoa as well as Desmond Ritter when in team sessions. Uh, it sounded like the Falcons were taking advantage of maybe the, the bigger weaknesses in terms of the Dolphins, you know, O line, at least, you know, the non Teron Armstead. Uh, weaknesses, you know, right tackle Austin Jackson, left guard Liam Meikenberg were uh, allegedly had some uh, tough days. It sounded like Joe Gaziano and Zach Harrison, who's presumably were stepping in for Calais Campbell up front, were praised by many folks for their performances and some of the plays that they made, not only in one on ones, but also in team drills and whatnot. We didn't get too much into how Desmond Ritter looked right you know, I, I saw some positives. I saw some negatives. So sounds like it overall was kind of an okay day for Desmond Ritter, uh, but sounded similarly to Tua 
uh, in terms of his performance in this practice, kind of up and down for both of those guys. From what I understand, in seven on seven drills in the red zone, the, both teams, both offenses were able to take advantage of the defense. But I think both all, both offenses had to settle for field goals when they did full team 11 on 11 drills in the red zone. So uh, that is going to be something that both teams will have to improve upon. You know, on yesterday's episode, we talked about how we wanted to see the Falcons D line sort of dominate the Dolphins offensive line in practice. Again, didn't sound like it was absolute dominance, but it did seem like the Falcons got the better of, of that unit in that battle. We also talked about how the Falcons defensive backs and corners were going to match up against this very, um, let's say explosive group of, of Dolphins receivers and just kind of like we expected Tyreek Hill reportedly looked like Tyreek Hill, you know, water is wet. Uh, Tyreek Hill was cooking dudes. Uh, I'm sure you guys saw the viral clip of uh, Trey flowers getting beat uh, out there, but it is what it is. As, as they say, you know, water is wet. Like, um, you know, I don't personally think Tyreek Hill is the best receiver in the league, but I think he's probably the hardest receiver to match up with because of that speed. Um, you know, I, I probably put him like three in my rankings behind the Baton Rouge boys of Justin Jefferson and, and Jamar Chase in my personal wide receiver rankings. But certainly, you know, Tyreek Hill doing what he did to Trey Flowers when when you let a player like Tyreek Hill get on top of you, you know, get that outside release uh, and, and get on top of you. you. You saw Trey Flowers try to get on his horse to <laughs> try to chase down Tyreek Hill and Tyreek Hill, you know, sort of slowing down and then breaking inside and, and Trey Flowers is going right past them. It, it's, it's basically the equivalent of, you know, getting on a fast break. And instead of just doing your typical sort of, you know, dunk windmill or something like that, or, or tomahawk or tomahawk dunk or something, you know, Tyreek Hill's going behind his back. He's doing a spin move. Uh, 360 is type of a dunk on a fast break. And it's like, all right, dude, like we, we, get, <laughs> we get it. You beat him. All right, relax. Uh, but, you know, Tyreek's going to Tyreek, I guess, you know, he, he is a cheetah. Right. And, you know, like I said before, previous on the podcast, all cheetahs must die. Um, but, you know, and some of you guys are like, what are you talking about? Like, go back and listen to the podcast <laughs> Fourth of July week and you'll get that reference. Uh, but, yeah. So, you know, Tyreek Hill, you know, did his thing, but it, it didn't sound like Jalen Waddle really was doing all that much either. So that's a positive, I think. You know, saw a couple of reports of Breon Borders getting the better of Jalen Waddle. A.J. Terrell had some good reps. Uh, several other, you know, Falcons defensive backs were able to break up passes in one-on-ones. So it, it seemed like Tyreek Hill was kind of the guy that was killing the Falcons, understandably, top three receiver, right? And then everybody else seemed to hold, hold their own uh, in, in their matchups with, with the rest of the guys. So that is a positive. Now, probably the biggest news coming out of the Falcons secondary was the injury to Clark Phillips. And we did get an update that suggested that injury may not be a major concern, but we'll break all of that down as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. Guys, now that it is August, it is fantasy draft season and underdog is the easiest place to play fantasy football because it is the best place to play best ball. And if you don't know what best ball is, think of all those times where you've been super frustrated that you put a guy on your bench that went off for like a huge amount of points. And think of the times where you started a guy knowing that he was going to have a good week and, you know, he had nine yards and you got zero points or whatever your scoring system. That can't happen with best ball, right? You know, all those frustrations go away with best ball because basically underdog is going to set your best lineup for you each and every week. Doesn't matter who you want to start. You get the best lineup possible every single week. And the best way to play best ball is with underdogs. Best ball mania tournament It's the largest fantasy football contest of all time and it's back it's bigger than ever with up to 15 million dollars in total prizes up for grabs and you can get three million dollars going to the winner right and last year's winner drafted his team in july so you want to take advantage of that opportunity and get in as soon as possible so that you can carve out your stake of those million dollar winnings and all you got to do is visit underdogfantasy.com or you can find them in the app store and sign up with the promo code locked on and you'll get your first deposit doubled up to $100 that's underdog fantasy promo code locked on So let's talk about Clark Phillips and the injury on him. And so this is still developing a little bit. We did get a little bit of an update late Tuesday that things were positive in, in or positive, negative. You know how 
medical stuff. We'll, we'll get into it. But like, uh, you know, we'll probably get more official word from the team tomorrow or the day after on Thursday. But for those that missed it, Clark Phillips did go down with an injury on Tuesday, was carted off the field with a lower leg ankle injury. According to observers, Arthur Smith did say after practice that he was kicked and that they were optimistic given that Clark Phillips was able to get up on his own. He's getting an X-ray rather than an MRI, which suggested that the team was more concerned about a broken bone rather than a ligament, at least in my very, very basic medical understanding of how that works. We did get an update after practice from Cameron Wolf of NFL Network, as well as Josh Kendall of The Athletic, saying that the Falcons got positive news. Now, you know, my assumption based off of that is that the X-ray came out negative, so there's no break in the bone in that regard. So, Hopefully it's just like a bruise or something like that uh, for Clark Phillips. And I know it was a little bit of concerning because the cart comes out, but uh, our guy, Joe Patrick of, of 92, 90 game made a great point on Twitter today that, you know, teams are extra cautious when it comes to practice injuries. And they generally cart off everybody who has an injury rather than like in a game, it's like, okay, hobble your butt to the sideline and then we'll, we'll then we'll check you out uh, in the game. And so in circumstances where that would probably happen in those circumstances, they don't really do that in practice. So they just bring out the cart for everybody uh, just to be extra cautious when it comes to that stuff. So when you see, you know, normally when you hear about someone getting carted off, it's usually like a devastating issue, but you know, in practices, at, at least in the training camp portion, don't automatically assume that, Oh, a guy got carted off. He's done for the year type of thing that you would normally assume if that were to happen, say, in October doing a regular season game. So hopefully we will get officially some updated news uh, exactly what the nature of Clark Phillips's injury is, but the initial reports are that he will be day to day. And that probably means that you will probably not see him for the rest of this week and probably will not see him on Friday for the preseason game against the dolphins, but we'll just sort of have to see. And, and of course we'll, we'll keep you updated at that as far as that goes. But, you know, at least the initial prognosis is particularly positive, at least with Clark Phillips. And, you know, that's a good sign because, you know, you don't want to speculate too much in this regard, but you, you know, there was a concern about, you know, how would an extended absence for Clark Phillips uh, do to the secondary, you know, because he's been working behind D Alford as that nickel cornerback. And because Mike Hughes who's also getting work now in Jeff Akuta stead on the outside also has been working in that nickel. You probably weren't too concerned about, you know, how it affects your depth chart because you already had two guys ready to go above Clark Phillips on a depth chart in that regard. But it did sort of potentially disrupt the momentum that Clark Phillips, by all accounts, had been having a great camp uh, so far and, and by all accounts was having a great day of practice before the injury, breaking up a couple of passes, uh, according to some folks that were on hand in Miami Gardens. Um, and so, you know, what this potential absence, whether it's, you know, a couple of days or a couple of weeks, you know, it potentially throws a wrinch in and in, installs that momentum that he had it, again, D. Alford seems like he's the presumptive favorite to be the starting nickel cornerback come week one. All accounts indicate that he has a firm grasp of that spot and it's his job to lose. But you did wonder if Clark Phillips continues to maintain this positive momentum that he had been building over the last, you know, almost two weeks that maybe he could close the gap by the time we got to week one and Later this summer, we would be actually talking about that as a legit battle uh, as opposed to the situation is now. But potentially this injury does sort of derail that momentum. But, you know, we expect once Clark Phillips gets back on the field, he'll pick up where he left off and and continue to solidify, you know, this Falcons cornerback room and, and be one of the, the promising players of the future. Certainly, you know, I can certainly imagine situations later this season in a couple of months where people are, you know, clamoring for for Clark Phillips to get on the field at some point in time to see what he has. So we will see how that all develops as we uh, continue uh, here on Lockdown Falcons. But we'll wrap up today's episode uh, talking about some of the, the strongest and weakest spots on the roster, um, you know, given, you know, the concern, the injury concern at the cornerback. Is cornerback one of the strongest or weakest positions, right? Listener questions about, uh, what area of the roster would you be most concerned about if the Falcons had an injury? What area would you be least concerned about? And we'll answer that question to wrap up today's Locked on Falcons.
So before we get into those listener questions, I do want to thank each and every one of you guys that makes this illustrious podcast your first listen each and every day. I want to give a special shout out to the everydayers. Tomorrow's episode, of course, will be giving you the lowdown on day two of Falcons joint practices. And then later in this week, we will be joined by Jarvis Davis to preview that Friday night preseason opener against the Miami Dolphins. So continue to make this illustrious podcast your first listen each and every day. So, um, Before we get into our next question, the other biggest takeaway from practice that I had, you know, more so than Clark Phillips, more so than the Falcons D line is that B. John Robinson's nickname is now Bojangles. Right. And that comes from our guy, Omar Kelly, who covers the Dolphins down in South Florida, had a nice little typo on a tweet he had. But it's going to stick. Right. Because, you know. Bill Robinson, a.k.a. the original Mr. Bojangles, it does fit with Bijan Robinson, right? You know, he was one of the great entertainers and icons, a great dancer, right? You know, so it does kind of fit Bijan, right, as far as a nickname goes. And then you, you couple that with the great fast food chain, at least down here uh, in the great state of North Carolina, its original home as well, spreading across uh, the southern United States of Bojangles uh, with the biscuits are far better than you know those planks of sand uh, <laughs> or Popeye's biscuits. Like I love Popeye's chicken, but their biscuits, ooh, dry as the Sahara, Sahara Desert. But Bojangles is where the biscuits are at. Um, but um, you know, Bijan just like Bojangles is it's cooking up linebackers and in uh, safeties, you know, and and frying them like chicken. Uh, so it, it does. It's you know double entendre. Don't ask me how. Um, when it comes to Bijan and Mr. Bojangles. So we will, we will get some mileage out of Mr. Bojangles for the nickname for Bijan Robinson moving forward. So that will be something to look forward to on this illustrious podcast, but let's wrap up and, and get back to the serious topic at hand. Our first question comes from Jim. He has injuries will hit the Falcons this year, just as they hit all NFL teams. Given that where can the Falcons most ill afford a major injury? Conversely, where do we have the depth to best absorb, absorb a major injury? Thanks for a great podcast from an everyday or Jim. All right. You're welcome, Jim. Um, right now, I would probably say offensive tackle is probably the area that of major concern when it comes to the, the team's depth. That would be the one position that sitting here today, I would be most concerned about an injury to the Falcons starters in Jake Matthews and Caleb McGarry. Right. We talk about swing tackle being an area of concern. And obviously, you know, over the last several months on this podcast, we've made a big deal about Corey Davis watch. Right. But if you ask me today, what position is the team most likely to address between now and the start of the regular season? It is the swing tackle position as opposed to the wide receiver position. The reason why we, you know, make a big deal about Corey Davis watch is because it's, you know, fun to run jokes in the ground. And because it's a very specific player that it's like, I don't know if the Falcons are going to try to upgrade the wide receiver, but in a world where Corey Davis becomes available, and that has been the topic of debate the last several months here on the podcast, is Corey Davis actually going to become available or not? Right. The Jets will tell you he won't be. But, you know, we believe that he will. But we'll see. Um, shout out to my boy, Jason Brownlee. Um, you know, he's he, he's going to help us out real soon. But it's, it's basically specific because like it's the idea of if Corey Davis is available, the Falcons will try to upgrade the wide receiver position. And it's hard to do the same thing with the tackle because there's probably like 15 guys that are going to get cut at the end of this month that, you know, the Falcons could wind up signing to be an upgrade over the swing tackle position. And the major reason for concern is just the utter lack of experience that the Falcons have at that position behind Jake Matthews and Caleb McGarry, right? Like their most experienced offensive tackle in terms of NFL snaps, playing tackle in an NFL regular season game is Josh miles. And he's played 19 snaps in a regular season game at tackle. And that's 19 more than anybody else on the Falcons roster. Right. And so like, that's why it's a concern, but we don't talk about it as much because it's like 15, as I said, there's like 15 guys the Falcons could wind up signing, including several guys on the Dolphins roster that they may wind up, you know, looking at um, should they become available later this summer. Right. And it's like, it's not as fun to be talking nebulously about, we, we can't do a Jerron Christian watch or something like that. We can't do a Dennis Kelly watch or, or something like that. Just because there's so many, that list of names of potential swing tackles is, is so long that it's not as fun as Corey Davis watch. So, just want to make that clear for, for folks that we, we talk a big game about Corey Davis on this podcast, but it's really swing tackle. That's the era. Cause they're now the hope is the hope is right. You know, whether it's Barry Wesley or Josh miles, when we get to Friday's game, these guys are out here, you know, cooking 
in the in the second, third, fourth quarters of that game and shutting down guys and and looking like a young Matt Gano, who we'll talk about a little bit later on today's episode to wrap up. But to answer Jim's second question in terms of what position could we best absorb an injury, you know, in terms of looking at and the way I'm answering, approaching this answer is looking at, okay, what has the smallest drop off from your starter to your backup and potentially to your third stringer. And I think running back is probably the obvious choice here that the Falcons could, you know, presumably afford, you know, down to their third string running back, which presumably would be Cordero Patterson, who is a starting caliber player in this league. Um, but beyond running back, I would probably go with edge, but only because we still don't 100% know how good Arnold Ebiketti is, right? Like based off of where Arnold Ebiketti finished last year, there isn't a lot of difference between him and Bud Dupree and Lorenzo Carter at this point in time. Now, you know, with Bud Dupree and Lorenzo Carter, my expectation is those guys are going to be like, give you three to five sacks this year. Now we're hoping that like Arnold Ebiketti gives you double that number, right? And if that's the case, then there is some drop off there at that position. But until then, Right. Like we, we don't know that yet. And so I would sit here and say there's not a whole lot of difference between Arnold McKinney, Bud Dupree and, and Lorenzo Carter at this point in time. So if one or, or, or of those guys went out, it wouldn't be a devastating loss. But again, that is based entirely off of where Arnold McKinney finished last year, not where he's expected to start this upcoming season. So that would be my answer to that question. Now, uh, we got another email question from Greg E. He asked, whatever happened to Matt Gano? Um, I don't know all the details of Matt Gano, but sort of piecing together what I do know is he suffered a neck injury in OTAs with the Falcons back in 2021. Then he sat out the entire year due to that neck injury. Then he signed with the Giants uh, as a free agent the following offseason, but then apparently had a setback with his neck injury and was forced to retire uh, last summer. So he is retired from what I understand. Uh, Greg E's last question is, who do you get your artistic talent from? I like tuning in on YouTube to check out the graphics. Appreciate that. Uh, that's always a little, you know, nugget. We give the video version of the podcast, uh, you know, what weird secret, you know, bad joke that I put up on that whiteboard behind me. Um, but as far as where I get my talent from, I, I'm assuming like you're asking like, you know, which, which side of my family? I don't know. Like, as far as I know, my parents, neither of my parents are, are particularly artistic. And as far as I know, none of my grandparents were particularly artistic. You know, they've all passed on um, in, in the last, you know, decade or so. So I, I don't know. So from that, my understanding based off of that, like, you know, my my skill is something I developed on my own as a, as a child, drawing much to my mother's chagrin on the Sesame Street wallpaper at night when I was supposed to be sleeping, you know, at three and four years old. And and that was a skill I cultivated. I was always like the top of my class in my art classes in elementary school and middle school. And then I want to say in eighth grade art class, uh, I, I got dethroned by a guy named Chow. Shout out to Chow. Um, and like up to that point, like I probably was like thinking like, oh, I could, you know, draw professionally or something like that. Like I, I could cultivate the skill and then I'm and then Chow basically <laughs> like I was Trey flowers and he was Tyree kill when it came to that. Right. I was like, oh, I thought I was pretty good. And then, you know, he did his 360 behind the back dunk all, every day in art class. And I was like, Oh, that's a, that's a, actually what a person who professionally could draw or be an artist professionally actually is. And so I haven't really cultivated my art ability since I was like, 12, 13, uh, a lot. So, um, basically I peaked at that age. And so now I'm just kind of dusting off those skills each and every day on the podcast. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's by no means don't expect any, you know, masterpieces or anything like that. Uh, one day I'll get chow up here to, to draw some stuff on the whiteboard and you will, you'll be blown away. Um, I wonder what that guy's up to. I haven't seen that guy since high school, but anyway, um, that's it guys. <laughs> <laughs> sorry sorry for going down memory lane now i'm thinking about all the stuff i did in eighth grade art class um but appreciate the questions from greg and jim of course they sent theirs in via email at locked on falcons at mail.com you can of course do the same you can also hit me up in the locked on falcons discord the link in the description below you can also hit me up on facebook or twitter at locked on well don't hit me on my facebook i, I don't look at the facebook anymore so i don't know why i say facebook you know if you're using Facebook to contact this podcast, good luck with that. Uh, Twitter, Locked on Falcons on Twitter uh, is the place to go 
for that. So those are the places to, to get in touch with me. Um, we'll be back on tomorrow's episode with more uh, breakdowns of, you know, day two of joint practices. And hopefully, you know, we'll see if the, if the Dolphins won day one. Usually that means the other team comes roaring back on day two. So we'll look forward to seeing, you know, the Do- the Falcons, I'm sorry, dominate the Dolphins even more on tomorrow's uh, joint practices. And we'll break that down on tomorrow's episode. So um, that will do it for us here, guys. Really appreciate you tuning in. Um, we will be back with more tomorrow. Continue to make us your first listen. And of course, you know, check out Locked On NFL for your second listen. Um, and, you know, go go check out Locked On Saints. Go listen to Ross Jackson, you know, talking about, hey, Kareem Hunt's coming to New Orleans. And then all of a sudden finding out that, hey, Kareem Hunt may not be coming to New Orleans because he's getting bigger money from Indianapolis. So, you know, go dunk on, you know, go do your Tyree Kill dunk. 360 dunk on on locked on saints comments uh you know when he's talking about tyreek hill on tomorrow that's that's your second listen and then you know go listen to whatever you want to listen after that uh so that is your homework for tonight guys really appreciate it it's all part of lockdown podcast network your team every day